Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Croucher. Uh, thank you, Heather. Thank you to Anne Rose. Um, and thank you to the University of Queensland and the, I have to read this right, the Australian American Fulbright Foundation for bringing me here. Thank you, Auntie Millie, for the wonderful welcome um, and that I want to acknowledge as well. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to speak to you this morning about intimate partner violence. Um, a couple of just caveats about language before I get started. One is, in the States, we tend to use the terms either domestic violence or intimate partner violence rather than family violence. Um, and so I'll be kind of going back and forth with that language. Um, the other is that over the 20 years that I've done this work, my language has evolved to aspirationally include people subjected to abuse as opposed to just women. And you know, I think that's a, a problematic language choice in some ways. Uh, in the states, the vast majority of victims of domestic violence are still women, as is true here, I believe, as well. And although it's important, I think, to dignify male victims of domestic violence, it's also important not to lose the ways in which this is a gendered phenomenon. So I use the term people subjected to abuse advisedly, and I will almost certainly default back to women probably around half the time. Um, so hard habit to break. Like many places, Australia is reevaluating its response to intimate partner violence, and my hope is to share some thoughts from the United States experience that might be helpful as you contemplate changes that you might make here. So first, just a little bit about my background. Um, I, although I'm an academic, I I'm a lawyer, um, and I have been a lawyer for people subjected to abuse for about the last 20 years. And um, when I started this work at the ripe old age of 24, um, I really believed that law was the best vehicle for addressing domestic violence. I believed that domestic violence was primarily a legal problem, um, and I agreed that we had done in the United States the right thing by making the legal response the primary response to domestic violence. And that was very clearly articulated in 1984 in the United States with a document called the Attorney General's Task Force on Family Violence, which said domestic violence is a criminal justice problem. And really, all of our law and policy since that time has flowed from that assertion. And I, I continued to believe that I was kind of doing the Lord's work in this work um, for about the first 11 months that I was in practice. And then I had a client who really helped me to see that my views were not nearly nuanced or complicated enough. Um, I was doing a divorce for a client, um, and I thought, this is wonderful. This is, I am the last kind of tie to her abuser. This is the last legal link, and I'm helping her to sever it. This is a great day. And I expressed something of those sentiments to her, and she looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, this is not a happy day for me. I didn't think my marriage was going to end this way. I have children with this man. I'm going to be involved with him for the rest of my life. And this is not a good thing that's happening to me. And I thought, wow, at 24, not being married, not having children, I hadn't thought about the ways in which this was really so much more complicated than just the severing of a legal relationship, right? It was complicated in lots of ways that I had never contemplated. And over the last 20 years, and kind of in watching the ways in which my clients have been served or poorly served or not served at all by the legal system, I have truly come to believe that, I don't, that the legal response is not necessarily the best response, and that we've made a, a fundamental mistake in the states in putting the vast majority of our time and our energy and our resources into the legal system. The legal system undoubtedly serves some people well, but it serves some people poorly, it serves some people not at all, and it affirmatively harms some of the people that it is meant to help. So to really serve people subjected to abuse, I think we need to rethink the legal response, and we need to think beyond the legal system as well. Just for a little context in the United States, uh, rates of domestic violence have fallen significantly since 1994, um, but so is the overall crime rate. And so we have, as Professor Croucher described, we have also federal legislation and state legislation. The big piece of federal legislation in the United States is the Violence Against Women Act. Since 1994, the Violence Against Women Act has poured hundreds of millions of dollars primarily into courts, prosecutors, and police in order to improve the criminal justice response and to a lesser extent the civil justice response to domestic violence. And when I say hundreds of millions, I mean multiple hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the two largest grant programs are the STOP grants and the grants to encourage arrests. They total about $250 million. And this is, again, every year since 1994 we've been putting this money in. So in that context, since from 1994 to the year 2000, rates of domestic violence fell significantly in the United States, post-Violence Against Women Act. But so did the crime rate overall, and in fact, they fell at exactly the same amount. And from 2000 to 2010, 
rates of domestic violence dropped actually less than the overall crime rate. And again, this is at the same time that we're putting all this money into the system. It should cause you to ask whether what we're doing is really effective. Um, and there's no research that suggests that the criminal justice response is responsible in any way for the decline in those crime rates or in those rates of domestic violence. So I think reason to question what it is that we're doing. In my book, A Troubled Marriage, Domestic Violence and the Legal System, I identify what I see as the four major problems with the legal response to domestic violence. And there are problems that I see echoed in um, the Australian Law Re Reform Commission report as well, and problems that Professor Croucher has already alluded to today. The first problem that I identify is the ways in which the law is excessively focused on physical abuse, and as a result, creates too narrow a definition of domestic violence. And I tell a story um, to illustrate this point because it, it does so better than anything I could kind of say academically. Um, so I had a client who was involved in a 19-year marriage with, I thought, the most abusive man that I had ever seen. Um, and the sum total of the physical abuse in this relationship was this. And he did that maybe three or four times, no harder than I'm doing it, over the course of that 19-year relationship. Over that same 19 years, he locked every cabinet, every door, every pantry, every, every space that could be locked in their house, and he had the keys. And so if she wanted food, if she wanted cleaning supplies, if she wanted to use the laundry machine, if she wanted to use the computer, um, she had to ask for permission, which could be granted or denied at his whim. Um, if she wanted a new roll of toilet paper, she had to hand in an empty spindle to get a new one. If she wanted clean towels, she had to ask for them. If she wanted to wash her clothes because she needed to go to work the next day, she had to ask to do that too. Again, that could be denied. She frequently went to work very disheveled. She was a teacher. And every day, he would give her just enough money to drive herself to the gas station, to put gas in the car, to get herself to work, and to get herself home. Every day, she needed to get more money from him to do that. She had no other access to money. If she wanted other discretionary money, she had to hand in a request on a 3 by 5 card explaining why it was that she needed it. That request could be denied for any reason. They had three children together. Over time, he stopped allowing her to eat at the family table, requiring her to stand up in the kitchen while she ate. Um, he would not allow her to talk to the family, telling the girls that you know, we're not interested in what mommy has to say. Um, he was verbally abusive in ways that I won't even begin to get into here, but you can certainly imagine. And at the divorce trial, at the end of this 19-year relationship, her friends testified that when she had met this man, she was an outgoing, assertive, ambitious, bright woman with a real you know, great future ahead of her. And by the time of the trial, she was anxiety-ridden, medicated for her anxiety, unable to really dress herself in any kind of put-together kind of way, unable to keep herself kept. Um, her children testified, or one of her children testified at the trial at his behest that she was a terrible mother. Um, and it, it wasn't actually hard to believe. She could not kind of function on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. He had systematically dismantled who she was over the course of that 19 years. And the law does nothing about that. The reason we were able to get her a domestic violence protective order at one point was this. But that was so far from the worst of the harm that she experienced. And the law's failure to take that into account, I think, is a tremendous problem. Now, I recognize that across Australia, in different jurisdictions, you have different abilities to take into account, for example, emotional abuse or economic abuse. And I'm going to talk about those things in a minute. But I've also heard that those things are not as easy to get orders granted for as is physical abuse. And I think that you have the same problem that we have, is that the law privileges physical abuse. That is how it sees violence. And even when the law is more expansive, as the uh, Law Reform Commission has suggested that it needs to be, we still have a culture that doesn't recognize these other forms of abuse. Um, Emotional and, phys uh, emotional and psychological abuse in the United States largely not covered by either the civil or the criminal law. Um, certainly economic abuse is not something that we see covered in either the civil or criminal law, though economic abuse is one of the primary ways that women remain entrapped in violent relationships. Reproductive abuse, uh, reproductive coercion, which is something that we're really starting to see interesting research on in the states now. So the use of someone's reproductive function to keep them entrapped in a violent relationship, whether that is by purposely getting somebody pregnant, or by denying them access to birth control, or by uh, destroying a pregnancy, um, interfering with a pregnancy in some way, but just using someone's reproductive capacity to entrap them. 
um, or spiritual abuse, which we're starting to see more of, for example, in the Orthodox Jewish community in the United States, where somebody denies someone the ability to carry out their spiritual life on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, for, if you think about it, right, spirituality is really at the core of who some people, right, not all of us, but for some people at the core of who they are. So denying somebody the ability, for example, in the Orthodox Jewish community, it's things like not being able to bake um, challahs for the Sabbath or not being able to keep the Sabbath in the way that you want to keep it um, really does get right to the, to the core of who they are. Um, for us, neither the criminal nor the civil law really covers any of these things, and I think that's a tremendous deficit in terms of our response to intimate partner violence in the United States. The second issue that I have with the ways in which the legal system responds is that the legal system relies very much on kind of a stereotyped perfect victim. And so if you come into the legal system, you need to look very much in like the victim that was art first articulated by Dr. Lenore Walker in her 1979 book, The Battered Woman. So Walker was really one of the first theorists um, on domestic violence, at least in the States. And what she portrayed was a weak, meek, passive victim of violence, unable to act out to, uh, to protect herself, very much in need of state protection, very much in need of someone to come in and do for her. And so when you go into court in the United States, and, and I should note that this stereotype has been enshrined in law in a variety of ways, you know, partly through the training that is done for uh, judges and prosecutors and police, which still to some extent relies on those stereotypes and partly through the law itself. So for example, in the United States, battered woman syndrome, which is based on the work of Dr. Lenore Walker, is still available as an excuse, not a defense, but an excuse in homicide cases in which a woman has uh, killed her abusive partner or otherwise harmed her abusive partner. But battered woman syndrome very much relies on these stereotypes that are embedded in Dr. Walker's work. And in some places, it's actually in the law, for example, that someone must have suffered what Dr. Walker called the cycle of violence, which is an idea that most of us no longer really use in any of our work, in any of the training that we do, and by the way, which isn't supported by the social science evidence. Even Dr. Walker's own data doesn't support the existence of the cycle of violence. So truly problematic to have this kind of embedded in the law. Um, even if you don't have that, though, I think we've all seen kind of this expectation that women subjected to abuse look a certain way, right? The essentialization, which is the fancy academic term for it, um, of women subjected to abuse. And what that does is it ignores, it denies the ways in which women's intersecting identities influence their experience of abuse, right? So that passive, meek, weak victim is also a white victim, is also a middle class victim, and is also a heterosexual victim. Those stereotypes are very much embedded in the law. And so that leaves out women of color, it leaves out low-income women, it leaves out rural women, it leaves out women with disabilities, it leaves out gay women and transgender women, all of whom have very different experiences of abuse and all of whom may approach the court in different ways. Um, I think, you know, the, what's problematic particularly about those stereotypes in the U.S. is that they're not just the result of Dr. Walker's work, they're also the result of political choices that were made by the battered women's movement to engage political support for domestic violence work, right? So you hear the rhetoric, well, domestic violence happens to everybody. It happens to everybody. It could be you, right? And that rhetoric is true as far as it goes. It could be you. It could be anybody. Sure, that's statistically possible. But the experience of violence is very, very different for different communities, depending on the resources that are available to them and the systemic and structural racism they experience when they try to get those resources and you know, various other kinds of things. But saying that you know, to white politicians in the United States, this could be your mother or your daughter or your sister, you know, definitely not your wife, um, but that this could happen to anybody in your ambit was used to really secure that kind of large scale funding that came through the Violence Against Women Act. And in so doing, it shoved the problems of other women under the rug in a very real way. Um, the passive stereotype is really problematic for women who fight back, for example. And in the United States, the research says that's African-American women and that's lesbians. So you already have disempowered women who are fighting back against their abusers and then coming to court seeking protection, and that stereotype works against them when they seek protection. Um, the white, straight, middle class stereotype is problematic for pretty much everybody who is not white, straight, or middle class. Um, and you know, those stereotypes become even more problematic 
when you think about the credibility problems that face women subjected to abuse, any woman subjected to abuse at the moment she makes a claim of domestic violence. It's been interesting to be here in Australia, um, and I attended a couple of different events, probably I shouldn't say by name, but, um, and heard you know, judges talk about, for example, their concern that domestic violence claims are misused to get a leg up in custody or in divorce decisions. That is the same argument we have in the United States. There's no research to support it. Um, and yet, judges routinely believe and they anecdotally say, well, it's happened to me. Well, yes, people misuse the system in lots of different ways, but there's no reason to believe on a widespread basis that this is the ways and that women are misusing the system in these ways. There is a credibility problem that women walk in with as soon as they say, I have been a victim of intimate partner violence. So marry that inherent credibility problem to anyone who is not conforming to this, that stereotypical victim, and you have a real problem when you're asking for help from the legal system. Um, the third major issue that I have with the way in which the legal system works is that it assumes that all women either want to leave their partners or should leave their partners, that separation is somehow the answer to intimate partner violence. And I think that's problematic on any number of dimensions. But here are the big kind of two dimensions. One, it assumes that everybody, that separation would work. And by that, I mean that when you separate from an abusive partner, the violence somehow stops. And two, it assumes that everybody should want separation. So taking those two things in turn, does separation actually work? I think anybody who works in the field can tell you no. Um, we know this just based on the work that we do day after day. You know it because you deal with breaches of protective orders. You know it because you tell, uh, talk to divorced women who cannot you know, get their exes to stay away from them. Um, separation does not work. In a study in New Zealand, uh, they showed that 50% of the homicides and intimate partner deaths in New Zealand between 2009 and 2012 took place in the context of a planned or an actual separation. So separation is not keeping people safer. And yet, every tool that we have through the legal system is a separation-based tool, right? Protective orders, uh, divorce, child custody, arrest, prosecution, conviction, probation, all of those things rely on the idea that separation is going to somehow keep people safer. And understand, I'm not saying it doesn't work for anybody. I'm just saying it doesn't work for everybody. And because it doesn't work for everybody, the fact that we only have tools that work on the basis of separation is deeply problematic, that we're not offering people anything else that can help them. Right? So first, I think we have this problem of assuming that separation actually works. You know, Martha Mahoney in the United States um, coined the term separation assault back in 1994 to describe a phenomenon that many people in the movement had been seeing for years, this idea that once you try to separate, for whatever reason, and that may be about kind of the assertion of power, right, at the time of separation, saying you don't control me anymore, and it may be something else. We don't really know. We've made assumptions, but we don't really know. But for whatever reason, assault increases at the time of separation, and the, the research around the world, I think, bears that out. So problematic on that, uh, on that side of things. Um, and in the United States, actually, our immigration policy also tracks separation. So for example, we have visa statuses like the U visa, which is available to victims of crime, but you can only get that if you cooperate with arrest prosecution. So you again, your immigration status is relying on this idea of separation. So that's the first problem with it. The second problem with it is even if we had good reason to believe that separation actually works, we're making an assumption that all people subjected to abuse either do want or should want to leave their partners. And I think this gets back to something that Professor Croucher mentioned as well. We have devalued love completely in the domestic violence movement. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. It is our dirty little secret that a great number of our clients, the great number of the women that we work with, actually want to continue their relationships. They just don't want them to be violent anymore. And we've done nothing to try to service that need, that the relationship continues, but the violence ends part. Um, instead, if you look at the literature on domestic violence, you'll see things like traumatic bonding. Um, the assertion that women don't really love their partners when they're abusive, they're just traumatically bonded to them, and the goal has to be to break the bond. So, you know, starting with Lenore Walker's work, which said the only way to stop the cycle of violence is to end the relationship or for her to die, um, and going straight through till kind of this work on traumatic bonding now, we're seeing a continued devaluing of the relationship. And yet, if you look at, for example, Beth Ritchie's work on domestic violence in African American families, you see that the violence doesn't start on average for two years. 
So over that two-year period of time, think about what you've invested in a relationship, right? You have fallen in love with someone. That love has continued to deepen. You have emotional dependence. You may have economic enmeshment. You may have children during that time. You may have a legal relationship that's developed during that time. It's a lot to say to someone after you know this average of two years, and not everybody's two years, but just to work with the average. It's a lot to say to someone, just throw that out now because it no longer has value, right? But that's what we're doing by our policy. Um, and I think that's tremendously problematic. And the, the fact that we've developed nothing to help people stay who are in intact relationships work within those relationships is deeply problematic. I, one more statistic. Um, in uh, Vermont, which is um, where I met Heather for the first time, in the Integrated Domestic Violence Court in Vermont, Judge David Suntag did kind of an informal study and found that 70% of the couples who were coming through that Integrated Domestic Violence Court either were still together or planned to stay together. So if that many people are planning to continue their relationships, how big a disservice are we doing in the law by failing to give them anything to help? The last problem that I've identified uh, with the way that the legal system responds to intimate partner violence is through the use of mandatory policies. We in the United States have developed a number of mandatory policies in response to domestic violence. Um, and they fall, they're largely arrest and prosecution policies. So just to give you a sense of what they are. Mandatory arrest is the idea that police should make an arrest whenever they have probable cause to do so at the scene of a domestic violence crime regardless of the wishes of the victim, anything else that they say, they, you go, you make an arrest. And that came about because police weren't making any arrests. Um, so in the United States, prior to the early, um, early 1980s or so, um, police were really weren't making arrests at all. And in fact, if you look at the police training manuals of the late 60s and early 70s, um, it says, domestic violence is a private matter. Just tell the guy to take a walk around the block until he cools down. Right? This is what police were being instructed to do, so not surprising uh, that they weren't making any arrests. There were class action lawsuits in the United States on behalf of women um, who had been injured because of police failure to intervene. And in response to that, and in response to um, a, a groundbreaking piece of research suggesting that arrest could lead to uh, le uh, decreased rates of domestic violence, these mandatory arrest policies came to be. Well, a couple of interesting things happened kind of after that. You know, one was that the person who did the uh, research on arrest policies said, please don't adopt mandatory arrest policies until we've had an opportunity to replicate this research. It's never been replicated. The best replication studies say that there may be a small, very modest deterrent effect in some communities, but there can actually be a harmful effect in other communities. Uh, Lawrence Sherman, who is the person who did that research, has been arguing against mandatory arrest policies for years. He's recently come out with new research questioning the efficacy of such policies. It's very hotly contested, but there is no good reason to believe that mandatory arrest decreases rates of domestic violence. So very problematic in that you know the vast majority of the states went ahead and adopted those policies. Um, Having dealt with the problem of arrest, and so just to say a couple of other things about that, um, actually before we go forward, um, unintended consequences of mandatory arrest included things like a sky high increase in the rates of arrests of women um, and a significant increase in the rates of dual arrests. So police would show up at the scene, try to assess who did what to whom, and kind of throw up their hands and say, well, we're arresting both of you possibly unintended consequences, one would think, right, of an arrest policy. The, the single biggest harm that's been done by mandatory arrest is to women. Having dealt with the problem of arrest, uh, battered women's movement turned its attention to prosecution and said, okay, we're doing, we've got all these arrests happening now, and undoubtedly, since mandatory arrest, rates of arrests have gone up. That we can say with some certainty. Um, done all these arrests, why are you not prosecuting? And prosecutors said, well, we're not prosecuting because our star witness doesn't want to go forward and we can't do it without her. Well, two things really happened in response to that, one which I think is terrific and one which I think is deeply problematic. And I recognize that in Australia, you don't have these things yet. If I achieve nothing else in being here, my goal is to, t is to keep saying over and over again, please don't adopt them. Um, they are terrible policies. So in response to that, prosecutors did something that was great. 
It's called evidence-based prosecution. And what they did was say to police, we need you to work a domestic violence scene the way that you work a homicide scene, right? You've got to take all the evidence at, at the time, at the scene, that we will need to do our prosecution as if she will not be there. And this is, again, something that's referenced, I think, in the Law Commission's report. Um, and so, you know, you get photographs, and you get medical records, and you get statements at the scene, and you have the physical evidence that you need to be able to make a case in case the victim doesn't want to go forward. And to me, that makes sense. I think that's good policy regardless, because something can happen down the line, right? The victim may not want to go forward today, but she might want to tomorrow. You want to preserve the evidence. That's just basic policing. But the other thing that happened was that prosecutors said, and we're going to bring these cases forward regardless of what the victim wants. So just as a mandatory arrest, as I should, I should have made this clearer, it probably was clear to you, in a mandatory arrest regime, it doesn't matter whether the victim wants an arrest or not. That arrest is going to happen. In a no-drop prosecution scheme, it doesn't matter whether the victim wants the person prosecuted or not. That prosecution is going to happen. In a soft no-drop jurisdiction, it means that they might try to get the victim to cooperate, but if she doesn't, no, you know, no harm done. But in the hard no-drop jurisdictions in the United States, what that means is the victim will be subpoenaed to testify whether she wants to be part of that trial or not. Um, it can mean that if she fails to comply with the subpoena, she will be arrested for failing to comply with the subpoena. It can mean that she will be jailed as a material witness until such time as the trial takes place. It can mean that she is prosecuted for perjury for making an, incons an inconsistent statement in the trial to that which was made at the scene. It seems to me deeply problematic that we're advocating for policies in the context of domestic violence that we have nowhere else and that are putting women subjected to abuse in jail. That cannot have been our t intention when we started doing this work. It certainly wasn't mine. Um, mandatory, so I know that Australia is grappling with the problem of police failing to bring criminal charges. As just an aside, Heather Douglas and I have had this ongoing conversation since I got here about the interplay between the protective order process and the criminal process. Police are not involved in our protective order process at all. I have this little hunch that it's possible that when, because police are so involved in your protective order process, that's why they don't bring criminal charges. Um, because they feel like they've already done everything they needed to do and they don't feel compelled to do anything else. It's just a hunch, not borne out by anything. Um, I know that Australia is grappling with this issue of police failure to bring criminal charges, and I know that mandatory arrest looks like a way to solve that problem because they don't have discretion not to. But there is no evidence that mandatory policies decrease recidivism or that they keep women safer. Now, you could get an argument in the states that we don't know this because even where the policies exist, Police have never fully implemented them. I think that's a fair criticism. I think it's also something to think about, that even when you tell police they have to do something, they don't always do that thing. Um, and I note that, just as in the States, enforcement is a big problem here as well, right? That we all have the same problem with trying to get enforcement of the orders that we get passed. Um, but even if there were better evidence of the effectiveness of these policies, I would still be very concerned about them. And the reason that I find them so concerning is because what they do is substitute the judgment of the state for the judgment of the victim and say, you are not capable of making a determination as to whether you choose to be involved in the criminal justice system, and so the state is going to step in and make that judgment for you. I think one of the downsides to what I think is the very right focus on coercive and controlling behavior in relationships in the United States anyway, has come with it the assumption that all victims of domestic violence are so coercively controlled that they are incapable of making decisions for themselves. And we have infantilized women in that process. I think that is deeply problematic. Over the 20 years that I've represented women subjected to abuse, I have had very few, if any, clients who were completely unable to make choices for themselves, particularly about the most important relationships in their lives. Um, and I think that you know, part of the issue that we have is about making uh, choices under conditions of constraint. So nobody, so the argument is, well, they're so coerced that they, they cannot make uh, decisions for themselves. We all make decisions under conditions of constraint. Now, my constraints may be very different than the constraints of somebody who's living in an abusive relationship, but it is a matter of degree and not of kind. And I think we do a huge disservice to women when we assume that they cannot have any meaningful input into these decisions. Um, and that's what I think we're seeing in the United States. These kinds of policies and other kinds of mandatory policies are hugely disempowering to women. 
They say to women, you cannot exercise your autonomy, you cannot exercise your agency. And right now, in the way that the system is set up, we have kind of a zero-sum game in that either the state or the woman gets to exercise authority, right? Um, and I recognize that the criminal justice system is not set up just to service the needs of individual victims, but also to serve the needs of the, of the polity and of the state. And that being said, as between women and the state in terms of decision-making power about how to deal with these kinds of relationships, I want the power in the hands of the woman every single time. That's just the kind of the policy position that I've staked out. And I recognize that it's deeply controversial. It generally gets me yelled at um, by people who really sought mandatory arrest policies in the states, and I'm happy to talk about that further. I also recognize that there's a problematic piece about children in there, and I'm happy to articulate that further as well. There's just It doesn't run well in the way that, that this kind of talk goes. Um, I think we need to be really careful of policies that give prosecutors or courts power to substitute their judgments for those of people subjected to abuse. So this is a place where I might disagree um, with one of the Law Commission's recommendations that allows courts or prosecutors to seek protective orders on their own behalf, um, unless that was done in consultation with a victim. In the states, we've had a problem of courts and prosecutors implementing those orders over the expressed um, uh, Opposition, that's the word I wanted, opposition of victims of abuse. And in one case in the United States in Maryland, where I live, um, the court put into place a three-year stay-away order over the opposition of the woman that essentially operated as a de facto divorce for that three-year period of time. And, was, and she said, I recognize that this was a problematic situation. We want to go to counseling together, yes, but I'm not afraid of him anymore, and I'd like to be able to try to work this out. And the court said no. And basically, we have a bigger commitment to, to other people, and I have the ability to override your wishes. I think that's deeply problematic. So let me be clear, because there's one thing I think that often gets misunderstood in my work, which is to say that um, I want the legal system to work. For people who want that intervention, I want it to work properly. I'm not suggesting that we turn away from the legal system altogether. I think that's problematic in lots of ways and deeply impractical. Um, I'm still a part of that system. You know, my, my students and I still go in and get protective orders and divorces and you know, help people who want that prosecution. For women who want, for people who want to take that option, I want that option to be there and I want it to work. So what could a reconstructed legal system look like? Um, you know, the two things that victims say continually that they want are time and information. And so thinking about reconstructing the system really means for me thinking about how to build in better time and better information into that system. So for example, more information in the police response. Um, I can imagine a, a, an interaction between police and a victim that goes kind of like this. So police come to the scene of the crime, they separate the parties, it's good police practice, they talk to both parties, they have a sense that an act of domestic violence has been committed. They go to the victim of that violence and say, okay, it's our sense that an act of domestic violence has been committed, so what might happen now is that we would arrest your partner, and if we arrest your partner, the partner will be taken to central booking, and they'll be kept there for two hours, eight hours overnight, whatever that looks like. They're likely to be charged with second degree assault. That's a misdemeanor. The maximum penalty for that misdemeanor in the states is six months in jail or a $500 fine. Um, if we do that, um, they'll be gone for this amount of time. Does that give you enough time to get your things together, get to a safe place? Do you want to stay here? The protective order remedy is also available. This might be a useful remedy to you. What works for you? I realize this is utopian and that it's highly unlikely that police are going to have these conversations with people, but they could. Um, and we could retrain police in a way that helped them to have those conversations with people so that they could make informed choices about how to go forward with these cases. Um, the other piece of that in terms of kind of building in time, one of the best thing that's, things that's happening in the United States is happening in the context of sexual assault. It's, it's just this little program in Oregon, uh, state of Oregon, called You Have Options. And Detective Carrie Hall started this program because she saw that uh, people, uh, victims were not going forward in sexual assault and rape cases. And she went to them and asked why. And they said, basically, we weren't ready at the time of the assault to make a decision about going forward. We didn't kind of have a sense of what that would mean for us. We were too traumatized to make that decision. And Carrie set up this program in response that's kind of a three-track system. The first track is an anonymous report. So you can go to police and say, I have been sexually assaulted, here is all the information, and I'm not telling you my name, and I don't want to prosecute right now. I just want to park this information with you unless and until I'm ready to use it. And the police say, okay. The second is a semi-anonymous report where you can give your name 
and you park the information and you can get access to services and supports through that police agency, but you don't have to go forward with prosecution. And again, same idea, right, that that information is there and preserved in case you need it. And the third option is traditional prosecution. And I think this is brilliant, right? Because it allows you to make a decision not at the point of trauma. Imagine coming to the scene of a domestic violence crime and being asked to make probably what's one of the biggest decisions in your life right then. We tell people all the time, don't make decisions in, at times when you are upset or traumatized, right? But we expect people to know what they want to do with their relationships right at those moments. So it gives people time and it gives people information. I think that's essential. Um, I can imagine a world in which interactions with prosecution happen along the same lines, where you go into the prosecutor and you say, I'm not sure whether I want to prosecute, and the prosecutor says, okay. Well, it's a charge of second degree assault, a second degree assault, and it carries this sentence. And this is what the trial will look like. You will have to get up and you will have to testify. And then you will be subject to cross-examination. And although it's a lovely commission recommendation that you not be able to be cross-examined by your abuser, in our protective order context, it happens all the time. Um, and I don't know which is worse, actually, a skilled lawyer or a skilled abuser. Um, but you will be cross-examined, and here's what you'll be asked, and here's what that will feel like. And if there is a conviction, the range of punishment goes kind of from nothing, essentially, to six months in jail. Is this worth it to you? Is this going to help you meet your justice goals? Because the conversation that nobody in the system is having right now is with women and with people subjected to abuse about what their goals are for these interventions. And if your justice goals can be met by criminal intervention, then that's how you should go. But it's, in, it's equally possible that one's justice goals aren't going to be met, right, by that kind of intervention. My justice goal might be, I just want to tell my story. Well, in the very mediated setting of a criminal justice process, I'm not going to tell my story the way that I want to tell it, because the judge is going to say it's not relevant or subject to the rules of evidence. I'm not permitted to say certain things. Or there might be a plea, and I never get to talk at all. So understanding what a woman's justice goals are, I think, has to be a kind of a first step in having any of those conversations. Um, and then finally, in terms of the reconstructed legal system, you know, we can think about the ways in which alternative dispute resolution processes can be part of a state process, though I have to say I have a preference for doing them outside of the state ambit. Um, I think that some of the best things about, for example, restorative justice get lost um, when you make it part of a state system. I think they may be starting to see that in New Zealand now, where every case that's eligible for restorative justice is going to a restorative practitioner for an assessment. And that, that kind of processing is becoming similar to the processing that happens in the criminal justice system. I think they have real concerns about losing the things that are special about restorative practices when they become in part of a system. For those folks who cannot, for whatever reason, find what they need in terms of their justice goals through the justice system, there needs to be alternatives that are extra legal as well. And again, restorative justice, I think, is a huge part of that response. Um, although it's very difficult, I think, to tease through some of the issues about when it's appropriate, how it's appropriate. Um, New Zealand has amazing standards for practice in restorative justice cases. If you're interested in that, I would, I would take a look at those standards. They're very thorough. Some of the problems that we've been grappling with are, you know, restorative practices very much require an acceptance of responsibility by a perpetrator before you can go forward. I'd say the vast majority of guys that I deal with are not going to do that, say, at charging. They may do it much later. And so are we going to be able to use restorative justice as a real diversion alternative? You know, I don't think so. I don't think it's ever going to replace the criminal justice system kind of writ large. Um, it may be something that helps women to achieve their justice goals down the line, uh, post-conviction or post-sentencing. But I think we have to think through kind of the ways in which we can provide justice in other ways. Some of the work that I've been doing is around the idea of community-based justice forums that would create community spaces within which women could come and have voice have their stories validated and get some kind of vindication in hearing from the community what happened to you was wrong and some kind of reparation, whether that be emotional or whether that be material in some way. I think, and I'm trying to make sure we have time for questions, so I just want to go quickly. I think um, economic stability is a huge part of what we need to be talking about. Um, both on the part of people subjected to abuse, but also on the part of perpetrators. There is research in the United States that suggests that domestic violence is more prevalent among under and unemployed men. 
So we might do more to deal with domestic violence by ensuring that men are not under and unemployed than we do by sending them to jail where, by the way, they come out of jail unable to find work because they are felons, right? And we just have, we're creating this cycle of violence where under and unemployed men are, are being violent and they're going to jail, then they're not able to find work, then they're going back into dysfunctional communities where the research suggests you're more likely to see domestic violence. And it's just a deeply problematic way of dealing with what is, to some extent, a structural economic problem. Um, I think that if there was one critique I would make of my book, it was that I didn't do enough with the structural stuff. Um, it wasn't the way I was thinking then, but I think, um, and, and I think we're afraid of structural kinds of reforms because it all seems too big and then we can't, you know, you can't make an individual recommendation that says make poor people not poor. Um, and so, you know, I think that that becomes frightening to people. We need to stop demonizing men, and this really is gendered. Um, we need to treat men like people. We need to treat them with dignity and respect, and we need to recognize that men who abuse are not just the abuse that they do, they are people. And we need to do this for a couple of reasons. You know, One reason is because it really hurts our clients, my clients, when I am dismissive of the, va the human value of their partners. Um, how does it feel to be a woman who selected a monster for a partner? You know, I think that's deeply problematic, and I think it undermines that love that people have. I think it undermines the feel the, of their children, right? Their children are half these people. Um, and so when we demonize men who batter, we're doing a huge disservice to women. Um, I think we're also doing a disservice because the procedural justice literature shows us that men who are treated with dignity and respect in state-based systems are much more likely to comply with the orders that come out of those systems even when they disagree with them. So if our goal is to change men's behavior, and I think that has to be our goal, men's abuse of women is only going to be stopped if men stop abusing women, and we have to figure out how to make that happen, how we change behavior. Treating men with dignity and respect is part of changing that behavior. So how do we do that? Offender intervention does not have a great track record in the United States. Um, the research is not fantastic on it, but there are some pockets of places where there is hope men will change around their children. They will change in response to their cultural communities. They will change in response to other men. This, I think, is a huge thing. We have to stop thinking of intimate partner violence as a women's issue. It is a men's issue. It is about men's behavior and men helping men to respond appropriately within relationships and men calling other men on their behavior. We're the victims, disproportionately, but they're the problem. <laughs> and they're also a big part of the solution, and we don't do well with that. Um, and finally, I think we need to en engage communities um, in becoming more accountable for violence. You know, we've largely ceded our policing of intimate partner violence to the state, and communities no longer have a real role in providing support for or um, kind of accountability right, for men who are abusive. We need to find ways to re-engage communities. There's really interesting work going on on that in the United States. Um, fair critiques of all this, it doesn't go far enough. It goes way too far. It's completely unachievable. I think all of those are fair critiques. I would say as to the last, though, you know, my goal was to lay all of it out and then to say to people, okay, so how do we figure this out together? So I wasn't about, it's kind of a punt, I realize. But the how do we actually do any of this question, I think really has to be about um, grassroots providers and victims of violence and communities working together to figure out what are the things that we can put into place. But I have to say, at least in the United States, we are not going to prosecute or incarcerate ourselves out of this problem. Um, in 2009, 2010, in the United States, there were 907,000 acts of intimate partner violence. We currently have 2.2 million people in jail. We are the largest incarcerated population in the United States. If we prosecuted all of those 907,000 people, and you know, we, we make the mistake of always assuming that prosecution equals conviction. It rarely does. Um, so when we make assessments of safety and we say, well, it'd be safer if there's a criminal prosecution, well, that's only true if there's a conviction, um, maybe, and depending on what the sentence is. Um, but even if each of those cases involved uh, uh, resulted in conviction and incarceration, we would be adding a huge amount to what is already the largest incarcerated population in the world and just, again, driving that problematic cycle. That can't be our response. We need to be thinking beyond those systems. Um, and so I hope that this actually just gives you a little start in thinking that way as Australia figures out what it's going to do. Thank you. I can do it. Just to, just to remind you about, keep your question short and say your name and uh, your organization if it's relevant to the work. Okay. Questions?
Hi, um, my name is Nicole Lawrence. Um, I'm a student who is passionate about, you know, reducing violence against women, um, and especially violence against women with disabilities. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, again, <laughs> I think that we see that women with disabilities are still a group of women who are not, who are hidden from this particular problem and yeah, I just, I just wanted to kind of like say, can we do something about that? <laughs> can we make it so that women with disabilities, you know, um, I know a lot of people say we, they're women and therefore they belong in the category women, but the, the issues that women with disabilities um, experience when, you know, experiencing intimate partner violence can be the same or similar can also be very, very different. And I think we need to have that um, in our policies. We need to, we need to have women with disabilities. Um, I don't know, they need to be in there. And I, yeah, and ag again, you know, when I, when I read the national plan here in Australia, they are hardly mentioned. Um, <laughs> when you look up women with disabilities or just the word disabilities, that word is in there probably twice in very small print. So that is, to me, that is a problem. So, Yeah, I, I think it's a problem everywhere. Um, and it's, again, you know, domestic violence affects different people differently depending upon their identities. And I think disability is a really powerful form of identity that has significant implications for the ways in which people subjected to abuse can respond. And it goes, you know, runs the gamut from and depending on whether we're talking about physical disabilities or intellectual disabilities, right? Can you even understand the court forms? Can you physically get yourself into a courthouse setting? Can you, um, are you reliant upon your care, on your partner for caregiving? Are you reliant on your partner for economic support? How does that change your calculation of how this all goes forward? If you have intellectual disabilities or mental health issues, how does that change the way that police interact with you? How does it change the way prosecutors interact with you? What is that, there are just so many questions that are raised by disabilities as by lots of different statuses, right? Um, that, uh, that we need to be grappling with rather than assuming that there is some one size fits all solution to this problem. There is, I think there's there, and then Auntie Millie has a question. No, no, no. Um, oh, thank you. Um, a million Ingram, I'm with Wyanga Group in Redfern, and um, I relate to so much that you've said because we've been trying to say for years to government to resource communities so they can deal with the issues at a community level because most of the women that I've worked with in uh, well, they're friends. They don't want their man arrested because we have too many deaths in custody when Aboriginal men go to, to jail and they want solutions at the community level. Governments just won't resource communities and um, the Aboriginal programs, what we wanted in, uh, in what we have in Redfin is Babana's men's group and the women work with those men's groups to say who's running it and say you talk with the men and tell them to so get through their problems and solve them and then get the family back together. That's the whole objective is to get the family back together without the violence. Um, but it's the resources. The money goes into either um, government agencies or to uh, non-Indigenous NGOs. Uh, and the other one was circle sensing that we have communities where there, um, the community sits, elders sit with a magistrate and they make decisions and it, it's a bit of a shame job as well, you know, that, that person is known. Um, so we're trying to do those things outside of the system instead of jailing them all the time. Um, so, you know, I'd like perhaps somebody here to, who had any powers to say they've got to start resourcing communities to deal with these issues there um, to help the women and children. And the other thing is it's always the women that's got to make decisions. We tell the police when they go in, when they give the yellow card to the women to go to a women's refuge or support them that, that they give the men a red card to say, you go and you have anger management, you go to Babana's men's group and you get counselling and you do this and the men have got to do something because if you come back two or three times, on a third time you're going to be arrested and you're jailed um, so that they've got that opportunity 
two opportunities to um, go and get help themselves and talk with their partner. So um, I just relate to everything that you said that we jailing them is not the way to go all the time. Yeah, so the, you know, for us, um, the kind of parallel example is in our African American community, and I, the deaths of African American men have been very um, prevalent worldwide news for us lately. Um, they're not news; um, just some of them finally got some publicity. You know, we have an ongoing problem with structural racism with the disproportionate death of men of color and with the unwillingness of women of color to have their partners jailed because of those same kinds of concerns. And you know, the resourcing issue is to me, you know, a deeply problematic one, right? Because government wants programs to look a certain way and to meet a certain set of expectations, which is inconsistent in some ways with the kind of individualized community accountability based work. And so thinking through how you can have state resources without having state constraints, I think is a really, really hard question. Um, but you know, that being said, um, we, you know, in the states at least, we've gotten completely away from the notion of community as a powerful source of holding people accountable and providing support for people. And the, the response that I frequently get is, well, you know, bowling alone. I don't know if you guys had that book here, but the idea that there are no communities anymore. Um, and, and I think the mistake that we make is in thinking of community as geographic. Um, that may not be a community, but religious communities exist and cultural communities exist and communities of people who've experienced abuse exist. You know, in India, one of the things that they're doing that's really interesting to me is um, at the very ground level, these Nari Adalats, which are feminist-based courts, essentially, but informal justice mechanisms, where you know, within rural areas, the women of those areas are able to hold people accountable. And I think we, if we were, if we could think more broadly about what we mean by community, we might have a better sense of how some of that is possible. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, my name's Renata. I'm from um, the Women's Domestic Violence Court Advocacy Program. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I had a question about, um, I guess you were bringing up the social economic issues around um, men's violence towards the end of your talk. Um, and I, I guess I agree with Ani Milley that um, it's important for men to take responsibility and for there to be programs, um, well-researched and um, resourced programs that um, support that. Um, and I also really echo your perspective that um, it's vital for women to have a choice um, within these procedures. I guess one of my questions though is about how the children fit into that, <laughs> and I'm sure you knew where I was coming from for a long way, but um, yeah, I, I agree that women should have choice, but children don't have choice, and right. as we know, there's a lot of different forms of violence, so even though the physical violence may well have stopped, it doesn't mean that the um, issues that aren't yeah, and you know, one of the troubling things that comes out of the batterer intervention research is that um, while men may stop their physical abuse, their psychological and emotional and, and verbal abuse may increase, which just shows that what batterer's counseling might be doing is teaching people how not to be criminally violent as opposed to, say, you know, violent in ways that will accept um, children. So children don't fit neatly into this talk, but as someone who did work on the intersection of domestic violence and child maltreatment for a number of years, it's a very much a concern of mine. And I would say a couple of things. You know, one is I think we've made a, it is unquestionable that being in a home where there's violence going on cannot be good for children, right? But there's a difference between not good for you and the level of harm that requires state intervention. One of the things that's happened in the states is that we've just assumed that exposure to domestic violence constitutes child neglect and then gone after moms. Um, for failing to get out of the relationships as opposed to gone after dads for being violent in front of their kids. Not a good system. So what I've always said is um, that when there are children involved and if we have reason to believe that the children are being harmed affirmatively, not just assuming that it's not good for you, but affirmatively being harmed in a way that the state would intervene in another kind of case, and if we have provided mom with access to services and supports that could mitigate that harm, and if she has chosen for whatever reason not to use them, that's when the state has an independent responsibility to step in. Because the state's responsibility to children is very different. Um, that mom is an adult who can make choices and she can make bad choices and bad choices have consequences and she can live with those consequences. But if there's a point at which a kid is being harmed and mom has been given the ability to stop that harm and isn't doing so, that's the point I think at which you have to step in. Um, 
we leave kids in lots of bad situations. We leave them with high-functioning alcoholics. We leave them with high-functioning dry addicts. We leave them in homes where there's verbal abuse or just people who are terrible to each other. We leave them with smokers who, you know, blow secondhand smoke in their face. So I think one of the things that we failed to do as a movement was to be nuanced about the research on the intersection of domestic violence and child maltreatment. And what happened in the states was in, in, it, in our zeal to get custody laws passed, that said you shouldn't give custody to an abuser. Um, we said domestic violence is bad for children. And here's all the research showing how bad it is for children. And we didn't talk about any of the research that showed that children are resilient, that not every kid is harmed. We were not nuanced. And what happened to us is that we got custody laws passed and then Child Protective Services went, oh, I'm sorry, is this bad for kids? Because let's just go in and start taking them. And we had a real huge problem in the US with something called failure to protect, which was moms being held accountable for violence that was inflicted upon them in front of their kids. And so I think it's a cautionary tale for us to think hard about what the unintended consequences of any policy intervention we make are, and to be nuanced and thoughtful about the ways that we use research, even if the political process doesn't like nuance particularly. Are we out of time, Heather? I'm so sorry, I think we're out of time. Um, so thank you all again for coming. Um, it was a pleasure to get to talk with you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lee, for that um, really interesting talk. I, I, I know it's uh, similar to the lecture that you gave when we were in Vermont, but I learn, each time I learn more about your work and, and your perspective, uh, it's one that for those of you here who are familiar with my work, uh, resonates um, from an Australian, my work from an Australian perspective, but we are dealing with uh, very much the same kinds of issues. And believe me, we've also suffered from the failure pr to protect issue here in Australia and continue to do that. Um, Ros, thank you to, to you too for making yourself available and for the presentation that you gave. Uh, you know, I think it's been not, not only work to date on the inquiries that you've contributed, but your continuing uh, work in the family violence area is um, hugely valuable uh, to us, and, and I thank you for that. I have just a, a, a token of our appreciation to both of you for um, being here and presenting today and for the time that uh, you put into doing that. So, Well, I do want to acknowledge the staff of Anne Rose, particularly Jess Gregory, uh, who uh, organised the event, and um, Rebecca Giles, but I can't see Rebecca here. She's outside organising something else now. I'd um, also like to acknowledge Jen Novak, who's uh, taking photos, and Dr Peter Cox, a senior research officer at ANROSE. So um, other staff of ANROSE are unable to be here today, but I just wanted to acknowledge and uh, thank staff of ANROSE who, who make these events happen. Um, everyone knows it's not the CEO, although it's often the CEO who gets the acknowledgement. So um, I, I wanted to um, make that announcement. So thank you all uh, for being here. We can't, there's no point having an event like this without you all. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge your attendance here and um, particularly those who ask questions. Um, it, it always adds to um, our understanding and, and where people are at and what issues are of particular relevance to your work and, and uh, you know, where you're at in your thinking about them, uh, the issue of um, ending violence against women and their children. So I wanted to acknowledge that and thank you for being here. Um, and that brings us to a close. Thank you. Thank you.